Our first structural connective tissue uh, between bone and cartilage, we're going to look at bone. And let's just define bone very simply as having uh, a matrix, meaning the support structures of collagen, collagen fibers interspersed with something called hydroxyapatite. And the simple way to think about that would be it's a combination of calcium and phosphorus. In this particular arrangement, sometimes known as bone salts. All right, so there's our matrix. That's our outer portion that the cells are living in. And so bone cells are called osteocytes. Osteocytes are bone cells which secrete a fluid form of bone or a gel-like form of bone called osteoid. An osteoid is what calcifies or hardens and becomes mature uh, bone in this framework. These little osteocytes live inside of their very tough outer shell that has hardened around them. If you want to think about it like that, maybe shell is not a great word, but if you think about the, perhaps this is the bone cell, so this is an osteocyte, and outside of it, if the osteocyte is the house, then the yard around it is all calcified. And so that little osteocyte is not going anywhere because it cannot move around inside of this hardened exterior. All right, so once an osteocyte is centrally located inside of the bone that it has made as osteoid, that osteoid hardens and the osteocyte can no longer move. And so we have to think about how would you get food and water, essentially, or how would you get nutrients to this little tiny bone cell that's stuck in the middle? And so it would need some pathways, right? It would need some pathways to get it there. And what I would put in the pathways would be blood vessels. It's a very simple rendition. I'm going to make it a little clearer here shortly, and then we're going to identify some of those characteristics. So that's the idea. You've got an osteocyte uh, that is trapped in a mineralized or calcified version that it has extruded around itself. And so now the osteocyte can't move. And so we want to think the matrix is outside calcified and the osteocyte is inside. And again, the, the trick is to get oxygen, food, water, take away waste materials, all that to that trapped, um, that trapped osteocyte. That's kind of interesting. There are two types of bone we'll study. The first one is going to be what's called compact. Another word for that is lamellar or lamellated sheets. If you think about laminated, the word meaning sheet. So there's compact bone. And this is the usually what we're thinking of when we think of the of a long bone. That's the example. Okay. And we'll discuss more about uh, compact bone versus the other type. We're going to talk about spongy bone in lecture. But right now, let's think about compact bone as being the 
that long bone that you're probably familiar with. So here is a long bone. And you may or may not know yet that inside of the bone, in an adult, is something called a medullary cavity or an interior cavity. And in an adult, that has a lot of fat in it. And many of you know, this is a long bone, the bone that you would touch or be able to feel on the outside would be the compact bone. That's what you can see on the outside of a bone and it running long ways and it surrounds the tops or the ends. You'll learn the word epiphyses later, and it surrounds the ends of the bones and forms a shell. And so it has to grow long ways and it has to grow side to side. So we're going in this direction and we're going in this direction as the bone grows. So that's all where compact is found. You could kind of see it on the outside of a bone if you were to look at it. The other type of bone that we can think about is known as spongy. A better term for it is trabecular. Because the word trabecular means little beams of bone or branches. Whereas this compact bone, you can think of laminated sheets. So by the little beams down here with the spongy, uh, let's locate that in this same bone that we drew up above. I'm going to put some crisscross pattern. And this crisscross pattern would be on the inside. And then there would be that medullary cavity again. Where the crisscross pattern is at the ends of the bone, let me make one. Here's just the end of the bone exploded, and this is the inside. Now we've got compact on the outside, but then on the inside, we're going to have this crisscross pattern, these little beams at the ends, for our example here, uh, spongy bone and compact bone are found in other types of bone as well. Um, you'll learn flat bones of the skull, like diploe and the carpal bones, all this stuff. We're just using this long bone example to show you that there, it's easy to locate the compact versus the spongy. So our spongy bone, let's make our spongy bone of green. And so when I point that out, spongy bone is at the ends of this long bone. Some of you are familiar with the idea that bones produce red blood cells, amongst other things. And so that's where that occurs, in spongy bone. Not so much in adults, but we'll see it a lot in children, and then the adults will see it in the flat bones. So spongy bone is located at the ends of the long bone, uh, and it's always, oops, deep, meaning underneath, to compact bone because of the way spongy bone looks. It looks like spicules uh, or little branches of bone, little bridges.
and those little bridges, I wouldn't want those little bridges. Here's a bridge, there's one, there's one, there's one. I wouldn't want those exposed. So I protect them underneath compact bone. And we'll look at that more in lecture, but this is just getting you the general idea. So compact is on the outside. Compact is on the outside and spongy or trabecular is on the inside. I'm going to go over to the next slide and we're going to draw compact particularly. All right. So let's talk about the bone, particularly the osteon. The osteon used to be called a haversion system. And you'll still see the word perversion uh, used occasionally when we're talking about uh, the central canal. But I'm going to stick with the word osteon. An osteon is the functional unit of, uh, of compact bone, which is what we're going to draw for our example of this type of structural connective tissue. And the osteon is a series of cylinders within a cylinder within a cylinder. And what I mean by that is I'm going to draw just a very rudimentary version. The first thing I need to do though before I grow anything in the body is bring out a blood supply. And so here's my artery. We're drawing a long bone, remember? So here's the artery and here's some branches off the artery. And then here's the vein that runs next to it. I usually always have those together. Not usually, but always. Okay, so now I've got our artery and a vein. And I'm going to encircle that in a cylinder of bone. Oops, I've got my little arms out there. And often this cylinder that these, this artery and vein are running in, I'm going to fill this in black. This cylinder in the center is called the central canal of this system, and it's where the artery and the vein come from. I'm going to add some osteocytes, so let's pick a different color here. I'm going to do the first ring around this bone in green. And so I'm just going to add an osteocyte here, 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 and here. And I'm going to connect them in a circle. I'm going to add one up here. And as these osteocytes secrete osteoid, and so I'm just going to draw it, pretending that they have secreted so much osteoid. And there's other little osteocytes living in these little caves, these little apartments, if you will. And they're all secreting bone. So if you think about them, all secreting bone in this fashion where it starts to cover that inner cylinder. Now we've got this first layer outside of the central canal. So when I mentioned osteocyte, an osteocyte is the bone cell, but it's living in its own calcified house called a lacuna. Lacuna. Lacuna means little lake. This is the house or the apartment 
of the osteocyte. All right, so if we were to draw the osteocyte in here, it'd just be a little guy inside of those things which I've drawn are green, but you really can't see the osteocyte much in there. Really what you see is the lacuna. And so just talking about how this forms, how we're going to look at it from the top down. I'm going to pick a different color here. Let's choose purple. So let's add some more osteocytes. And I'm going to, and of course they're going to be everywhere in this next layer out. Now I'm just going to pretend that they have secreted their circle or cylinder, right? And so also, let's draw another layer. I think you get the picture of what I'm doing here, which is just layering upon layering. Okay, we're going to connect these guys in a circle. And then, of course, there'll be their osteocytes and lacuna everywhere. And that forms another cylinder. So, of course, you can't see all this stuff on the inside. All you can see, if you look down in a cross section, are those rings at the top. Now you kind of can see how they got here. This is not a beautiful rendition, but if I'm thinking about how compact bone grows, it grows from the center out like a tree, right? So if we were to cut a tree and look down and count the tree rings, So this is the tree ring growth pattern. That's how the osteon itself forms. However, in that tree ring would be little osteons, I'm sorry, osteocytes living in their lacuna. Okay, and so here, now that we can see how this is formed in many layers, let's draw it from the top down as though we were looking in cross-section again. So there's our central canal that we drew here. And I'm gonna go out one ring and I'm just gonna add some little lacuna, which we know have osteocytes living in them. And now I'm gonna add another ring and another and maybe one more. Okay, and so when you're drawing this yourself, the reason I explained all that is because it can be a little confusing as to how these rings form. They form in long cylinders, and what's making them are the osteocytes, which are secreting osteoid, and the osteoid is calcifying or hardening, and it forms in these sheets hence the name lamellar. Lamellar is the same thing as compact bone. And so we have these lamellated sheets or these concentric concentric means circular and concentric rings. And so sometimes people call these lamellated sheets concentric rings instead of lamellar rings. And all those words can be used. You, you may see any of them. Uh, and so also we have, again, we have our little osteocyte. I've already drawn that up here. We have our little osteocyte living in a lacuna. Now, if you're living in a a bone or calcified apartment or house, you have to have a way to get nutrients 
and you have to have a way to get rid of your waste products. And so you'll want to talk to your neighbors. And the way that they do that are through little baby connections between them. Little tiny canals. And there's a word for the tiny canals called canaliculi. And I'll write that here. I'm going to leave it in that fine spidery looking print so you'll associate it with these baby or tiny canals between these calcified apartments that contain osteo, uh, I'm sorry, contain osteocytes. I have too many words in my head. <laughs> right, and then the other thing to remind you about is that in that central canal, I'm going to take that word away, the CC word, and put what's really in there, which is our vein. and our artery. And of course, those have extensions going out uh, in all directions so that everybody uh, can get food and water, essentially groceries and oxygen, and everybody can get rid of their waste products, everybody being the osteocytes. So we have little lacunae. We have lacuna. We have osteocytes, we have concentric rings or lamellar rings, whichever your teacher calls it at your school. And we have a central canal. Okay, we worked with that up here. I'm gonna just point that out again. I'm gonna abbreviate it central canal. And then we have canaliculi, canaliculi. So what you see, even though it might not look organized how I drew it, but it is a very organized uh, set of rings that are put down in sheets from the inside outwards. That's how the bone widens, and it also lengthens. There's two different ways that it, that's going to happen that you'll learn about when you get into uh, lecture. All right, so now we can see that general setup for this osteon or this haversion system. The central canal is also called a, a haversion canal. But I would just use the words uh, central canal. And this entire thing, again, is called an osteon. And that is the functional unit of bone. And I'm not going to draw it for compact or trabecular because they don't have osteons. They still have uh, concentric layers. They're just not arranged in this cylindrical fashion. They're beams that reach across to the other bridges. And so they tend to look crisscrossed. Remember that spongy bone was found at the ends of the bones and it's arranged along stress patterns a little differently than this compact bone is arranged. Let's talk about cartilage. Cartilage is the other structural connective tissue besides bone. And we're going to cover three types of cartilage. The first one is the one that I'll draw. So hyaline cartilage uh, is our first one. The second one is going to be elastic cartilage. And our th third type is going to be fibro cartilage. Okay, so we can look at these words and think, first of all, cartilage. When you think about cartilage, we're thinking about a matrix. It's sort of this amorphous, um, same heterogeneous gel matrix. So let's think about it just as a I like to think of it as Swiss cheese. <laughs> Swiss cheese, if you know what that is, 
Swiss cheese, the Swiss cheese matrix with chondrocytes. The word chondro means cartilage in lacuna. And there's the plural for lacuna, uh, lacunae, which you learned for bone. Remember that osteocytes live in lacuna as well. So I've got the Swiss cheese matrix uh, and chondrocytes living in these little, the holes in the Swiss cheese, which are the lacuna. Now let's look at, um, I'm going to look at the other two that we're not going to draw first because I'm just going to describe them to you. An elastic cartilage you may be aware of as being in the ear and the nose because that's what gives the ear and the nose, the tip of the nose anyway, the flexibility. Um, elastic cartilage is a lot of elastin fibers. So elastic fibers make up um, the fiber component, but it's mostly matrix. So mostly matrix. It's not a lot of fibers, but the fibers that are there are elastic. And again, you're going to find this in the ear and the tip of the nose. The elastic cartilage is very durable and flexible. So the tips of your ears, you know, this part is the elastic cartilage, and then the tip of your nose, this part again, very flexible. The rest of your nose, not so flexible, but the tip, very flexible and durable. We'll rebound and um, return to their original shape, hopefully. And that's the elastic component that we think about when we think about the word elastic. All right, so we've got elastic cartilage. Fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage, you recall fibers are the toughest thing your body makes pretty much besides bone. They're the next step down from bone. And so whenever you see the word fiber, just think really tough stuff here. And so because um, connective tissue is full of fibers, you're thinking about this is a tough cartilage. And fibrous cartilage or fibrocartilage is very strong. Um, collagen fibers particularly instead of elastin. So here we've got collagen fibers in the matrix. And actually the uh, collagen, there's not much matrix <laughs> at all in this stuff. It's mostly just fibers running in a direction, in opposite directions to make this very strong. Let's think about places we could see this. And I'm going to write down the meniscus. Meniscus you have in the knee and the TMJ, temporomandibular joint. Another place we might see it would be in the, in the intervertebral disc. So the I, intervertebral disc or the IVD, the intervertebral disc between the vertebra. Those are very strong. They have to last you your lifetime. And another place we might see it is at the pubic symphysis. In the anterior portion of the pelvis where the um, pubic bones meet. You remember where there's a, maybe you've seen the pubic tubercle and all those things, but where the pubic bones meet is the pubic symphysis. What's the deal with fibrocartilage? It is very strong. All of these places I've mentioned, the meniscus, the IVD, the pubic symphysis take a lot of stress. Um, obviously the meniscus for the knee and then the mandible where the jaw meets the uh, facial bone, where the jaw meets the cranium, the TMJ, lots of stress, re repetitive stress right there. And then the intervertebral disc of between the vertebra, lots of stress and carrying loads and all that kind of thing, going downstairs, running, uh, bending, lifting, all that stuff. And then pubic symphysis, just walking 
in general, not to mention running, jumping, all of those things that we do. Fibrocartilage is holding these articulations or where these two bones come together, holding these together uh, well or providing lots of padding, strong padding, such as the meniscus. In any event, wherever it's located, fibrocartilage is very strong due to the collagen. And the arrangement of the collagen is usually in opposite directions so that you would find something like this inside of the inner vertebral disc, etc. Hard to pull apart, tough stuff. This last one, hyaline cartilage, is the one I'm going to actually draw. And hyaline cartilage is the most common. So we'll say it's the most common. It's found at the ends of all the long bones and uh, where your ribs meet the sternum, various places, but it is the most common type of cartilage in the body. It is very glassy looking. And that is what is actually what is the word, that's what the word highland, as I understand it, means it's glassy, shiny. What do you know about glassy, shiny things though? Glass, slippery, but if impacted, it's also brittle, right? And because cartilage doesn't have a bone supply, I mean a bone supply, because cartilage doesn't have a blood supply, remember it's avascular, I'm going to throw that in here. No blood supply directly. It's relying on movement to create sort of a vacuum or a suction of the fluid across its surface and then through the cartilage itself to both pull and push wastes uh, out and pull in nutrients and oxygen. And so when cartilage is injured, say at the ends of a joint uh, by osteoarthritis through wear and tear or from an impaction, say a person uh, stepping off of a five-foot ledge and breaking their ankle. Whenever cartilage is injured at the end of a bone, it doesn't heal very well because it doesn't have its own blood supply. So you have to be careful with our cartilage. We don't get any more. Um, to look at the, po the point of cartilage is to reduce friction between two bones. And some areas where the ribs connect to the sternum, it's to allow some motion to occur there too. But for the most part, cartilage for today is just going to be to reduce friction. So what, what do we think about what cartilage looks like? I'm going to use some certain colors for this because the way that cartilage stains, it tends to look what my students and I like to call purple soda drink. <laughs> I don't drink purple soda or pop, but I have, as I've seen it before. So I'm just going to outline a box here. We're going to just call this a sample of hyaline cartilage. And in our sample, we're going to paint the matrix this light purple. This is going to help you identify hyaline cartilage when you see it under the microscope because it really does look purple. It even has a bluish tint to it sometimes. So I'm not going to color this in perfectly. We're just getting the idea that there is purple, light like purple or lavender in the matrix. And I'm going to take a darker color, just draw some lacunae, meaning this is where our chondrocytes are going to live. So let's label that. This is a lacuna. And inside the lacuna, I'm going to put chondrocyte. So 
So there's our little cartilage. So living inside of the lacuna, watch this. Sometimes they live in a pair like that. And that's also one easy way to help you identify hyaline cartilage on a sample. Now they won't look black on a microscopic version. I'm just drawing them in there like that so you can see it. It'll all look different shades of purple, maybe some pink, maybe some light blue. All of those things are possible with hyaline cartilage. So let's just add a little bit of that to remind that there may be some blue in the stain as well, some light blue. Okay, so this part here, this is the matrix. This is between the cells, uh, between the lacuna, and then the chondrocytes living in the lacuna. It's pretty much what you need to know as far as the characteristics of hyaline cartilage. You have a chondrocyte, you have a lacuna, and essentially you have that purplish pink um, grape soda looking slice when you see it under the microscope. Hope that helps you out a little bit. Let's do that purple so we remember hyaline cartilage. Also remember that hyaline cartilage is brittle and glassy and slippery. Reduces friction, don't want to break it, no blood supply to fix it with.